Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for um, joining today's webinar. Uh, my name is Chris Bridges um, from PFP, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Andrew Stanley. Uh, the slides do mention Kevin Igo. I've stepped in at the last minute here to host this webinar. So thank you very much for attending, everyone, and Andrew, welcome to today. Hey, thanks, it's Chris. great to see so many people on today's webinar. Um, topical update on capital ounces and um, all of the grey areas surrounding that and bits and pieces to run through. Um, please do ask any questions that you have throughout the webinar. We'll field as many of those as we can during the webinar. Um, if we can't answer all the questions, which is usually the case with these webinars, then we'll make sure we get back to you on email as soon as possible afterwards. Um, just to explain the relationship with STAX, um, we've been working with STAX for a good number of years now. They're our professional partner in offering capital out services to our, to our member firms. So, Andrew, welcome today. Thank you very much. And um, we'll get cracking. Yes, thank you very much, Chris. And good afternoon to everybody out there. Thanks for so many of you tuning in uh, at this time of the year. I know you're probably all recovering from a rather, rather crazy January rush, uh, as, as we are as well. Um, so today we're going to have a bit of a look mainly at the changes that affect capital allowances on fixtures that kicked in back in 2012 and 14. We've run this webinar a few times, but it, it, a lot of people still contact us and ask us to run it again because these changes are still causing a lot of issues for uh, owners of commercial buildings. And as we'll see later on, there are some pretty hefty well, financial risks for non-compliance. So getting your ducks in a row in this area is, is, is certainly worth investing a bit of time for. So what are we going to look at today? Well, we're going to start off by having a bit of a look at the background to capital allowances in, in this particular area. We're going to look at the, the what are they, how we go about claiming them, and to be honest, why, why should we be, be bothered? So apologies if that's filling in any, any covering any old ground for anybody out there, but it's, it's good to just make some rule on a, on a solid foundation of understanding before moving forward. We're then going to have a good look at the new legislation, what changed in 2012, uh, what sort of uh, dangers does this throw up and what opportunities are there as well. Uh, we're then going to move on to have a look at a few case studies to illustrate the kind of strategies that can be employed or you know, the kind of advice that you can give in this area to your clients. And as we'll see, if that advice isn't given in a timely manner, then potentially there may be financial losses for your clients. And of course, a certain element of taxpayers out there will be looking to see uh, who dropped the ball uh, and effectively whose insurance can they can they approach to try and get their losses back. So spending a few minutes having a bit of a look at studio cares in this area, uh, who owes it and what you can do to make certain that you're not put it, inadvertently putting your neck on the block is certainly going to be um, a couple of minutes well spent. So. I'm going to run through all of this relatively quickly. A couple of reasons. As Chris says, there'll leave plenty of time for questions. Just type them in. We'll try and answer as many as we go along. There will leave spaces at the end of each section um, to, uh, to, to run through any more in-depth questions. And of course, we'll come back to everybody we don't get a chance to speak to on air. But I'm also going to run through this pretty quickly because I've never had anybody complain that a webinar about tax was too short. So. Capital allowances. Well, what are capital allowances? Uh, I'm guessing I'm speaking to an audience full of qualified professionals out there, so I'm not going to spend very long on this. To the man in the street, they are the tax allowed form of depreciation, a uh, tax relief that is claimed upon capital expenditure on plant and machinery. Funds go into one of two pools, in which you get a writing down allowance each year uh, on a reducing balance basis. The annual investment allowance. Again, conceptually, I'm going to assume that everybody out there knows what this is, only mentioning it because it's now extremely high. The Chancellor's put it up to £1 million for the 1st of January. Of course, since the change from Labour to the coalition government, we've had it at 25000 50000 100000 200000 250000 500000 and a million. And not in that order and not changing you know, in, in time with the tax years every time either. So there's nothing like consistency in tax policy to allow businesses to plan for the future and this is absolutely nothing like that. So at the moment a million pounds, I mention it because if your clients are making new qualifying expenditure it's a great time to look at this because the chances are they can write off all or at least the vast majority of their eligible spend. So what can you claim capital allowances on? Well in essence it is a plant and machinery relief. The identification of machinery never really caused too much of a problem. 
It is an apparatus with moving components that affects a process or change. For example, a tractor or a lathe in a factory. What is or isn't plant is a very different animal. Because there's been no statutory definition of what is or isn't plant, it's a subject of over 120 years worth of case law. The closest we come to a definition is that it is not your trading stock and it is not the raw fabric of the building that you trade with it. Now, that negatively defines it as not being those two items, which of course leaves potentially an infinite number of items that could or couldn't be plants. Hence the lengthy amount of case law. That definition is actually from an employment liability case from the late 19th century. So still seen as the authority in this area today. What are we concerned with? Well, I'm not sitting here today imagining there's any sort of confusion with capital allowances in a wider sense. I'm sure all of you are adding value to the pool for all loose items of plant, such as you know, transit vans, um, you, you know, you IT infrastructure, desks, machinery, whatever happens to be loose and used within the business. I'm, you're, I'm sure you're all very capable of adding up the invoices and putting them in the respective pool. However, things get a little bit different when you are looking at fixtures. Now, fixtures are defined as being any item that's actually fixed to the building. So if you glue it, nail it, screw it, embed it, it becomes a fixture and therefore it's become inseparable from the cost of the bricks and mortar itself. So the fire system 4000 is a fixture and of course the transit van, unless driven very badly Chris, is not fixed to the building and therefore is not a fixture. I think Andrew one thing that you mentioned to me in the past, um, if you took a building and you shook it upside down, it's all the bits that wouldn't fall out. Look, exactly, exactly. That's probably yes. the best analogy I could give to it for me to understand it. Yeah, if we did that with cranes to our clients' buildings, though, they may not be very happy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not, not the, the process we go through. But um, so, a couple of examples just to kind of hammer home this difference. Because I would stress this the, the, the line between fixture and loose plant is, is where a lot of the misconceptions and confusion comes in. And also, the accounting treatment is often very different to the tax. Uh, treatment. So looking at this picture here, the vast majority of the items you can see are items of plant and machinery as fixtures. So things like the sink, the hand dryer, the disabled grab rails, the mirror on the wall, the plumbing and so forth. You then within fixtures have a subsection called integral features. Now this is effectively just the handle for special rate pool fixtures. Okay, They came into being in 2008. So it was tax neutral at the time. So whilst it brought several items that were acceptable as main pool items of plant and machinery down into the special rate pool, like heating, air conditioning, and lifts, and then also brought several classifications of systems that were previously ineligible, such as the general power distribution, lighting, and cold water, into being special rate pool items. That was deemed to make it tax neutral. And that's an important date to remember because we'll see a bit later on that the new legislation has a bearing on items of plant that a vendor to a transaction could add to their pool. So if their expenditure predates this April 2008 change, there is likely to be several classifications such as the electric, the lighting and cold water that they've never had a legal entitlement to pool. And therefore, the new legislation won't have a bearing on it. But we'll cover that a bit more later on. So. Here you can see the hallway in a hotel that we surveyed many, many years ago now. Uh, in this setting, decorative items provide a business critical function. Okay, They make the place look nice and that justifies people, uh, the room rates, it attracts customers, they come back, they tell their friends and so on. So in this setting, the chandeliers, pictures and so forth on the wall, maybe even decorative lighting, uh, you can set some picture lights there. Uh, all these sorts of items come into play as items of plant and machinery, as fixtures, used within the business. If this was the loading bay of an industrial unit, even if they were someone like you know, the Cinderella Shoe Company, something like this, you probably find it difficult justifying spending a lot of money on chandeliers. Okay, bit of case law here for you. This first came about uh, in the Scottish Newcastle Breweries case back in 1982, reaffirmed then later on in the Wimpy case. Um, generally, businesses in the leisure industry can claim a much wider scope of finishes than other types of industries. So hotels, pubs, restaurants, and so on. So one last slide on this before we move on, just to make it absolutely clear the distinction. 
So the green arrows are pointing to the forklift and the desk. Now these are items of plant and machinery and almost certainly are going to be eligible for capital allowances in this setting, but they are not fixed to the building. Therefore, it's not something that us here at STAX are interested in, and it's not something that the new legislation we'll touch on in a minute affects. But what we are looking at are things such as the mechanical um, and electric parts of the moving shutter. You've got the electrics on the wall there. You've got the runner and the vinyl curtain. You've got the signage, and you've got a whole host of items that you cannot see because they are in the walls, the floors, and the ceiling. But they are plant and machinery fixtures nevertheless. And because of this, you end up in a situation where most businesses are claiming this amount, whereas this amount is actually available. Now, this is no negative reflection on firms in general practice, because a lot of these items would have either been installed during major building works, and you know, even itemized account, I'm sure you guys will identify the lion's share of, of what's eligible, but the real life isn't normally that straightforward. And often the details will be hidden in very ambiguous invoices that say building works £200,000, or you'll be hamstrung by having far too much in the way of data, such as many, many bin liners full of 299 screw fix receipts for a bag of nails and a tube of glue. So that's where you require uh, maybe in, outside input from a firm like ourselves, because we can take the total cost, look at the total works, and using you know, a combination of tax and quantity surveying techniques, break one down into the other. Also, a lot of the items that are eligible for capital allowances would have been in place when the building was actually purchased, which means that part of the bricks and mortar cost, the actual purchase price, plus the stamp duty, legal fees, any other, you know, any other capital cost that you know, contributes towards the consideration, is partly in place to pay for the items that were in the building at that time. Unfortunately, the purchase price almost certainly isn't going to bear any direct correlation to the sum of the components that make up the building. There's many other factors that drive the, uh, the acquisition costs, such as you know, the, the rental potential, redevelopment, the purchaser's um, own plans, what they're going to do with the building, they may have the rest of the block, for example, and even the, the negotiating skill of the parties involved. Okay, And because of that, you can't simply just claim the value of the items, even if you could just value more directly, we have to go through a process called an apportionment to break apart that purchase price into the elements that, uh, well, the parts that you can and can't claim. Now, this is empowered by Section 562 of the Capital Houses Act, so it's a statutory right to do this. You know, these items have been purchased by the, um, by the uh, business in, in question, and effectively what we're doing is calculating the ratio between the eligible and ineligible and then multiplying that back into the capital consideration. So just to kind of flesh that out a little bit, you can see the pie chart there on the screen, okay? Imagine this is the full reinstatement cost of a building. My quantity surveyors will go to the property and derive an itemized rebuild schedule for that particular structure. From this, we can analyze the data and we can isolate all the items that are eligible for capital allowances. So let's imagine that's, 25% of the total. Well then by default, left of all the items we can't claim capital allowances on, so let's say that's 35%, and then we also value the land using uh, what's called a residual land value appraisal, effectively what would a commercial entity buy this cleared site with planning permission to build this building on, given the types of rents that could be achieved. So imagine that's 40% of the total. We can now take the part of this ratio that relates to the eligible plant and machinery, i.e. the 25%, and we can multiply this through by the amount actually spent by the building. So if you bought the building for a million pounds, you're now adding £250,000 to your capital allowance pools, which equates to, in saved tax, £47,500 in corporation tax, or £112,500 in additional rate income tax. So that's over 11% if you like cash back, for want of a better word, um, on what is a relatively norm, it's not a large commercial transaction by any stretch of the imagination, it's a hell of a lot not to claim, um, on, you know, to simply just throw away uh, it, it, by, by not getting your ducks in a row in this area. So, oh, what, one, one point here, we're gonna ask this question almost every webinar presentation. There is no correlation between claiming capital allowances on fixtures and 
affecting your future CGT or chargeable gains. You are not reducing your base cost. The bricks and mortar cost of the building stays the same. So if you sell the property at a profit, you, you are still paying the same amount of capital or chargeable gains uh, as if you hadn't made a claim in this area. The only link is if you sell the building at a loss, your allowable loss is restricted by the amount of relief that you, you actually claimed. So, what sorts of buildings can you claim capital allowances on? Well, in the eyes of the Act, all buildings are eligible, but then there's an exclusion for dwelling houses. Now, it's accepted by HMRC that a building may comprise multiple dwelling houses, such as, say, a block of flats, and the space outside of the dwelling houses, you know, hallways, lift, reception, and so on, the items are perfectly eligible. So we can look at all forms of commercial use buildings. We can look at the communal space in large residential properties. And what we seem to be doing a lot more recently, because I think they're becoming a very, very popular with the rise of Airbnb and the changes to deductibility of mortgage interest, furnish or they lets. As I'm sure some of you are aware, when you shift into that sort of area of, uh, of letting, from say buy to let, a whole host of other reliefs are opened up because you suddenly become much more of a business rather than a passive letting activity. Uh, quick note on timing and viability. Barring the changes that happened in 2012-14, there's no statutory time limit on how far back you can look to pull against your expenditure. So you could have bought a building 50 years ago, Chris, and we can we can go back, trace the history of the building all the way back to that point, and then claim as a percentage of that purchase price. Probably wouldn't be worth doing because you probably bought it for five and six in, in old money. Um, but it, if it was more recent, I've said the last 10 or 15 years, it's probably going to be a, you know, a reasonable figure. You can't reopen that tax return from 10 or 15 years ago. You probably wouldn't want to. But you can carry the leaf back through the amendment window. So looking at the uh, little diagram there, at this time of year, having just gone past the January filing deadline, which is also the end of the amendment window, if we were to process through a historic um, capital amounts with you on a building, uh, one of your clients or yourself would be able to carry that back into the return you've just filed and actually get a tax rebate on the income tax you would have paid a few weeks ago. And then it would be WDA, so you'd be claiming the relief on it, carrying the balance forward, reduce tax for this year, and so on. How do we go about this? Well, unfortunately, it's not an overnight process. If you want to look in this area, there's several um, several things that need to be done. The tax history of building needs to be traced all the way back to 1996. That seemed reasonable when the Capital Outs Act was rewritten in 2001. We are still tracing the history back to 1996. We did check with the tenants, solicitors, you know, yourselves as the uh, you know as, as the accountants to quantify and verify if there are any restrictions or pre-agreements or capital allowances that will prejudice somebody's rights to claim. Like building a solid foundation, justification for it to sit on. The building is then surveyed, either very large, largest building we've worked on, doing doesn't take more than a day or two on site, or there's a lot more calculation back in the office then to quantify the makeup of the, the actual property. Details are analyzed and a report issued to you, the client, showing what, what we found, where we found it, all the calculations, photographs, floor plans, and so on. That's then attached to the tax return, and sent to HMRC so they can see where all this tax relief has come from and also they can see it's us that's done the work. A common question we get, Andrew, often is what's the what's the sort of expected timeline of the process? And I, I know the answer to this, but you may like to uh, go, go through that. Yes, uh, it can vary a lot. Um, generally, you're talking... <laughs> I didn't know that was coming up genuinely, so, so there we go. <laughs> two to three months. Averages between two to three months. We have done, I think the quickest was about three and a half weeks. Okay. Uh, that's only possible. The, the history to the building is very straightforward. People come armed with purchase documents and so on, because um, it's normally the validation stage that takes a long period of time, especially on the older purchases. We, we have to get information from the conveyances who handle the transaction, and if they've gone bust and transfer their files to another file, or they don't work with that client anymore, it, there could be some hurdles to overcome. So yes. it, if there are fine deadlines coming up, we can prioritize work and try to push it through, but generally we are talking a few months from start to finish. So speaking about this earlier is, is generally better. So why should your clients care? Uh, to be blunt, there's a whole host of bullet points there on the screen. I'm not going to read them out. For a successful business, well, the largest cost is going to be tax. So if you're an investor, as a landlord, or um, you know, an owner occupier, as a trade, um, then anything you can do legally, non-contentiously to reduce that 
is certainly going to be of interest. So the bottom line is money. So here's a little um, bit, of, bit of maths for you on a Friday afternoon. If you were to buy an office with air conditioning and lift uh, that makes 5% rental profits a year, average claim on this sort of building is about 25%, depending on where it is in the country. That means that, of course, if you wrote it all off with the AIA in year one, you won't pay tax on your rental profits for five years. Now, they're not pie in the sky figures. They are you know, quite, quite, quite conservative in some instances. Um, and that makes the actual investment itself significantly more interesting for you know, the higher rate income taxpayers or even corporations. So what's the benefits to you and your practice? Well, as you can imagine, I spend a lot of my life out speaking to firms in general practice, doing CPD lectures and so on. And as I'm sure you're all aware, there is a split in the marketplace, um, for, yeah, I dare say a dichotomy in, uh, in, within general practice accountancy, two different parts moving in, in, in opposite directions. And this is unfortunately driven by the fact that people like Zero and cash flow have ripped the guts out of the value for your base compliance work. Um, for simpler businesses, a lot of it can be done now for 15, 20 pound a month subscription. Um, and if you're seeing that as your core bread and butter and, and, and so on, then you're dragging a bit of a, unfortunately, a terminal race to the bottom of your feet. There are several you know, larger firms that set up as factory firms who are firing out hundreds of tax returns and accounts a day that you're competing against who will do it for, for very little. The other half of the market is looking at adding value to their client relationships. And they're doing this by becoming more of a business advisory role and bringing in, you know, specialist specialisms either internally or externally as and when required. And this is helping people to, uh, you know, to, to, to justify their fees, grow the business, build better bridges with your clients. So putting forward capital out services like this may only be relevant to a very small number of your clients who actually own their own buildings, because of course most of them are going to rent, you know, relatively short lease agreements and so on. Um, but for those clients, it's extremely relevant, and it is you know, saving them a, a big chunk on their on their tax bills. It's certainly going to increase levels of goodwill. It's you give you a competitive edge, edge over um, other accountants in the area, and of course keep you out of that race to the bottom with with fees. Uh, we do pay a referral fee to compensate you for your investment of time in this area. Um, so it's another small income stream into your practice, and being a carrot and stick scenarios we'll see in a few minutes, you will avoid the potential headaches of non-compliance with the new legislation, which can lead to large financial losses, which is only going to have the opposite effect of what you want. Just had a couple of questions come through, Andrew. Um, one that quite a few of you guys are asking for is um, copies of the slides. Um, I should have mentioned at the beginning. If I didn't, we will send out um, copies of the slides after the webinar for everyone on there. So you, you don't have to ferociously be scribbling everything down. Um, we will send out copies of the slides afterwards. And um, quite an interesting one from Philip. Thanks for the question, Philip. Um, just referring back to an earlier slide, Andrew. Um, would you really bother claiming CAs on a £5 yellow sign? I think it's... Uh, <laughs> Um, well, it all, it all adds up. Um, you may have a hundred five-pound yellow signs in, in in a building. Still not a huge, um, uh, you know, you know, it's relatively small beer in the scheme of things. But um, we we pride ourselves on capturing everything that is eligible. Um, and you know, we're going around. We will catalog catalog every single item in in the room um, because it all all adds towards the total. Um, so yes, I do see your point. Uh, five pound. There's not a particularly expensive sign in that particular slide. I think you're referring to as a stick-on one, um, but it is. You know, it is something to, to add it. So yes, we, we we would. Yeah. So, the new legislation. Well, I call it the new legislation. Came about in the Finance Act 2012, which makes it two years older than my daughter, and it certainly feels like she's been around for a while. However, I still call it the new legislation because every time I go and see a firm of solicitors who handle commercial conveyance, there is about a 90% chance it is all new to them. Um, and many people are still unaware of the changes in this area, and they have a huge impact on your clients if they are buying or selling qualifying buildings um, you know, any time after 2012 and 2014, to be honest. So the legislation only bites where a building changes hands. So let's have a look at what's supposed to happen. Let's imagine a hypothetical industrial unit 
Chris, you bought this building a million, uh, ten, 10 years ago for a million pounds. He spoke to us, um, say, seven years ago. We found 250k worth of new pool additions. Just imagine a single pool system for the, the example here. You've used the WTAs over a number of years and you've got 100k tax written down value sloshing around in the pool today. You decide to sell this building on, you've had enough of, 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 of owning it, you know, yep. you retire, whatever you're going to do. What's supposed to happen is you and the incoming owner have a commercial discussion and fix an effective transfer value for this pool by joint election. This is called a section 198 election, which I'm sure some of you out there have come across. This can be set anywhere from a minimum value of one pound per capital ounce pool, right up to the total amount added to fixtures, added to the pool for fixtures that are still in the building. So in this example, barring any major enhancement works, we're talking the whole 250,000. So to give you an idea of what sort of impact this has on both parties' uh, position, I've run a little example on a few key numbers. So direct seesaw, so it's the same addition value to the purchaser as it is a disposal value to the vendor. So if it was set at £250,000, the purchaser clearly had their Weetabix that day, they get an addition to their pool of a quarter of a million pounds. Chris would have to bring into account a disposal charge against his pool of £250,000, which as he only has £100,000 in his pool, drives him into a negative 150, which actually creates a balancing charge to his taxable profits. So Chris will pay a sizable amount of tax on a effectively notional profit. So a bit of a disaster for him. If it was at 100K, it would take all of the tax run down value from Chris to the new owner. If it was at a pound, well, the purchaser gets effectively nothing, and Chris retains £99,999 worth of tax relief on items he doesn't even own anymore. Now, we're often asked, well, how can HMRC be happy about that? You've got to bear in mind these reliefs are just moving. Uh, so these, these elections are just moving tax relief from one party to another. There's still the same amount of jam in the jar. It's just either all on one side or on the other or split. So to be honest, HMRC is relatively neutral on them as long as they're you know, written, written correctly. Historically, though, a lot of transactions are going through without these elections in place. OK, and the idea of the election was that it was supposed to regulate the, the total amount of relief in the system. So if I built a building and then used it within my trade, and I claim a thousand pounds on the boiler, when I sell it on to Chris, am I supposed to send all, some or none to him? In the absence of an election, it, it, it was felt by the treasury that, that Chris, the, you know, the next owner of this example, would go ahead and claim a thousand pounds on the boiler. Then he'd set the building on, and the next owner would claim another thousand pounds on the boiler. And because of this, it was felt, People were double claiming relief back in 2012, and Mr. Osborne was not happy about that, as you can see from this photo. Um, the more cynically minded of us will recall that Deloitte's Capital Ants team did a study into the amount of latent claim in the marketplace and came up with a figure of £82 billion unclaimed on fixtures. And of course, you remember 2011 12, Mr. Osborne was desperately trying to reduce our deficit, and I think it was an eye watering fault of all that tax relief coming home to roost at the same time. So whatever the motivation, he set about doing something about it. And that's why we have section 187A and 187B of the Capital Allowances Act. Now, every tax webinar presentation requires a horrific bullet point slide. I feel I'm pretty good at minimizing. This is, this is, this is my one. Um, let me just focus on the main two things there, okay? What you need to be concerned about is the pooling requirement and the fixed value requirement, okay? The pooling requirement kicked in two years after the, um, the, the, you know, the, the, the kind of start date, if you like, in April 2014, but the fixed value requirement was there straight away from the 1st or 6th of April 2012. You're buying or selling a building today, they are both in effect. What do they mean? Well, the pooling requirement states that anything that the vendor was entitled to add to a capital ounce pool, they have to add to a capital ounce pool in a period up to or before sale, otherwise basically nobody else ever can. So if you're buying a building for somebody and they have no idea about capital allowances, in the past, you could have done a bit of homework and potentially claimed as a percentage of your purchase price. Now you can't do that. You need them to add the value to their capital allowance pool, and then you need them to comply with the fixed value requirement by fixing some form of official transfer value on this pool balance, okay? And the fixed value requirement only recognizes two mediums to do this. One, a section 198 election, or two, a decision in the tax tribunal. 
nothing else will satisfy it. No other forms of agreements, clauses, you know, you know, words said over a gentleman's handshake or whatever, none of that counts in the eyes of the, uh, of, of the legislation. So you really need to be putting in place these, these elections. So a couple of notes to this. Well, actually, let, let me give you an example of the impact of this, of not complying with this. Because if you don't comply with the fixed value requirement, both parties will get the worst of all outcomes. The vendor will still have to apply a market value disposal in a rising market, they will, against their pool, which is uh, the table under section 196. Uh, so Chris would end up, if he didn't comply with the fixed value requirement, losing the whole 100,000 in his, his uh, tax return value in his pool, and also getting this horrific balancing charge. The purchaser wouldn't even get a pound, they would get nil on all those items, and this would be binding on all future owners as well. So from a, from a monetary perspective, Chris has just lost 100K worth of tax relief and also crystallized a tax charge of nearly 30,000 pounds of a corporation tax or maybe nearly 70,000 pounds of income tax. Purchaser has lost all um, right to this relief and they just devalued their nice new building straight away for the word go. And of course, HMRC has taken a quarter of a million pounds worth of relief out of the system and possibly netted quite a chunk of tax at the same time. Treasury figures estimated that the benefit to them would be 35 million pounds a year. There's no stats out there, but you can see that Mr. Osborne was looking quite a bit happier. Um, when I was giving this presentation back in 2016, I was saying he's probably not, not looking so happy anymore. But I think I think he's landed on his feet since then, so he's probably back to, to, to smug George, as we all know. A nice array of George Osborne photos you've got. Yes. <laughs> got a couple of questions come through, Andrew, if that's yep. okay. Yep, I will. Um, Helen, thanks very much. And just a question about um, leasehold. So can capital allowances for a building be claimed against a lease for offices or the whole building? The leases are between 12 and 15 years. Uh, potentially, yes. Um, capital allowances, as the name suggests, are claimed on capital expenditure. So when you get a, a shorter lease, anything less than 50 years, every year from 50 down to zero, 2% of a premium becomes a revenue item rather than capital. And therefore, the amount that we can actually apportion claim the percentage against gets smaller. So something like a 10 or 15 year lease, it's probably not going to be much from the grant of the lease that we can look at because they probably didn't pay any premium at all. Probably more of a rental arrangement where they're paying an amount every quarter, every year for access to, to the building. But where we do do a lot of work with leasehold um, premises is where people are taking 10, 15 year leases and then they are spending a lot of money on fitting them out. So we come in effectively where your work as a general practice um, stops. So you would go through that, probably pick up the low hanging fruit, the invoice is there for £30,000 of air conditioning and so on, and then you'd be left with a big chunk of known unknowns. We can come in and break them apart into the eligible and the ineligible. So in short, if we're looking at renovation or improvement expenditure for shorter leases, if it's 50 years or longer, then you are likely to see that there's a large premium, yes, a fat 999 year lease, um, and it's all capital. So in that instance, it, there are some, some different bits of legislation for grant of a lease, but generally it's, it's, it's like a, a pseudo freehold at that point, Chris. A couple of other questions come through. David, thanks very much for your question um, regarding your, your property in France and um, holiday let status. I think that's one Andrew might want to follow up afterwards while okay. we go through yep. the webinar. Um, Jenna, thanks for your question. Um, could you as a practice prepare a claim? How would you do this? Um, again, I think we'll follow up with you after the webinar okay, on, yep. on how we can look at doing that. Um, so I'm quite conscious of time. Lots of other questions, but if we crack on for now, Andrew, and we'll okay. answer a few more as they pop up. So a couple of things in new legislation to bear in mind. Um, as I mentioned near the beginning, the mandatory pooling requirement only has a, a bearing, if you like, on items that the vendor to a transaction is actually able to add to a capital out pool. So, um, you now have several scenarios where they can't add anything to the capital allowance pool. They may be a government body, they may be a pension fund, they may be a charity, they may be a developer who's holding the asset as trading stock, which, if you like, is a bit of a windfall if your client is the acquirer, because then the chances are they'll be able to make a full unrestricted percentage claim of their acquisition costs, rather than you know getting into a claim and transfer scenario with the previous owners. Generally, uh, oh, actually, one more thing on that point. We mentioned the 2008 changes. So if you buy a building from somebody who bought the building before those changes and they haven't upgraded, you know, substantially the electrics or lighting or so on, they would never have been able to add these to the, uh, to the capital allowance pool. So even though sometimes when we're looking at buildings, often this is where there's a receivership scenario and we can't get enough information to justify a full claim and the receivers can't claim and transfer the relief across, 
there may still be a silver lining to that cloud and that if the people who have gone into receivership have owned the building for a very long time, they may have owned it since before the 2008 changes. There may still be something that we, we can look at. Not, not a huge amount, but it might still be worthwhile. You know, it's better to get something, a small slice of the cake than a big slice of, um, big slice of nothing. So on the fixed value requirements, if you are acting for the vendor, Section 198 elections are an absolute must. A lot of people I've spoken to, watched the webinars, been to the CPT lectures and so on, they said, well, we haven't, we haven't made any large claims in this area, we haven't done any surveys, so we don't need to worry about it. It is a very unusual building where there hasn't been anything claimed on any fixtures. There may have been £20,000 on air conditioning or there may have been you know, new, new LED lighting installed. It may not have at the time flagged up as being a fixture, but it, it's still underneath this legislation. And if the sale goes through without a Section 198 election in place, there are two things that can happen. One, HMRC can come knocking two years down the line and ask pretty much for the whole lot back, which is not going to be a very happy letter to receive. Or the purchaser, the purchaser can refer the matter to the tribunal. And the tribunal's view is that in the absence of an election, the vendor has to bring a disposal charge in place under the, the table under Section 196, which lists all sorts of events and disposal charges that will have to be put in place, which is broadly speaking the whole lot in a rising market. And the purchaser has just made new qualifying expenditure to buy these items. So the kind of figures the tribunal in a determination will, will, will put in place are very good news for the purchaser and extremely bad news for the vendor. So general rule of thumb, if you sell in the building, elections are a must. Even if it's just a defensive, it's not great practice, all plant machinery, two pounds election, just in case is better than not having any. If you're a purchaser, you really want to take this to the tribunal because the tribunal will give you a much better outcome normally than, than, than arguing with the vendor over election values. Quick question, um, Andrew. Come through from Gareth. Thanks for the question, Gareth. Um, before we move on from Section 198, can you go back and do a Section 198 election after a building has been sold? Yes. Um, you have effectively a two-year window from when the sale goes through. Okay, That election needs to be in HMRC's hands within that timeline. Two years in a day, you can imagine how sympathetic they are. Um, so this means that if the building was sold, say, a year ago, we can potentially go back and like repair the scenario. You've got a situation where, where the vendors can't add anything to the pool without effectively closing off the history of an election, and the purchaser can't do it without the vendors putting it in the pool and sending some of it to them. So both parties are blocked. It takes two to the tango, and they can't move forwards without working, without working in tandem. Two years down the line, everybody loses and, and the Treasury wins. So there is a win-win path that can be put in place that they can both tread. You will generally have to make it interesting for the other party. So we spend a lot of our time contacting previous owners of buildings and saying, look, you add this to the capital allowance pool and transfer 80%, 70%, some often 50% to our client. You keep the other 50% of your capital allowance pools for, for, for doing this. And it's better to get some of the value rather than, than none of it. Um, so, so, so yeah, it, it, given there might there are often nuances in the history, so it's always worth us having a look at something. We only charge as a percentage of what we deliver at the end. So if you were to send us the details of the transaction, we can go back to the history from land registry. We can get a whole host of information on the building and we can, we can hopefully try and get something from it. Not always. Um, so we never say never, but it is better to give advice before exchange of contracts because afterwards you've lost any sort of leverage on the other party. So a couple of questions just to mentally run through. If you get a call, phone call from a client saying, I'm looking at buying, I'm looking at selling a building. And of course, the reality is you normally get a phone call saying, I bought the building six months ago. What's my advice? Well, the advice then is let's step into my time machine and go back seven months and you can call me <laughs> then. Um, but if they do phone you before they actually you know, transact, a couple of questions to, to run through mentally. You know, is the legislation in effect here? What's the tax status of your client? What's the tax status of the vendor? Um, is, it, you know, is it something that's worth investing time in if they're both you know, it's going from one pension to another, it's a bit of a moot point, really. Um, have allowances been claimed? You would hopefully, if you're acting for a purchaser, get copies of the CPSEs, which have a section in it for capital allowances. You don't often get a lot of sense in there, but sometimes you do. And of course, if you're acting for the vendor, then you should know what has and hasn't been added to the capital allowance pool. Has something already been agreed? Um, you know, has a, it, it, you're bidding on an auction? you're often signing up to terms before you, you, you even start. So you might find your hands a bit tired on that front. Who's in the driving seat? Will they cooperate? Is this a buyer's market, seller's market in this part of the country? 
And a quick kind of sense checking question, if you're acting for the purchaser, is what did the vendor pay for the building? Because you're often going to be claiming as a percentage of what they bought it for. And again, if they've owned it since you know, 1912, it may not be worth investing a huge amount of time negotiating you know, contractual terms to, to, to secure you know, four pfennigs and a, and a penny or something on these lines. So that was new, well, the changes in 2012. Of course, the, the ramifications of it are huge. Um, and we could run a, you know, a one week seminar on it and only really scratch the surface. There are many, many permutations of different state purchases and sellers and, and different strategies that should be applied. I hope that's given you a bit of a flavor of the issues and the kind of things that you might want to um, you know, focus on. A couple of very quick case studies, just conscious of time. Uh, I think we. We've covered a lot of the, the, the types of things, these illustrate that we've been running through, but um, the first example just covers what we call a classic kind of claim and transfer. So our client contacted us, these are all post-2014, so both, both the main requirements are in effect, pooling and, and fixed value. The client of ours was buying a hotel in Kendall for 1.6 million, past owners bought it for 1.2 million. We were contacted during the conveyance. We've got the CPSEs, which for those of you who don't know, are the commercial property standard inquiries, you know, our legal cousins in conveyance. I can do as little work as possible. So they use standard list of questions which they send to each other and capital out is, is a section on there. Um, they came back with a lot of question marks and not applicables, which indicated they had no idea what was going on. Uh, we drilled a bit further into it and got confirmations they had not claimed in, in, in this area. So we sent example clauses to the conveyances, uh, broadly stating that the vendor would add everything we found to the pool post completion and transfer it across by joint election to our client, which they agreed to, Chris, because they wanted to sell the hotel. So we went in, surveyed the building afterwards, found £320,000 worth of new pool additions to claim and transfer from the vendor to the purchaser. And we also found a further 64000 on the pre-commencement technical features, which would be the lighting, the electrical yeah. power, and so on, which could be claimed in our client's hands directly. There's no disruption to the conveyance because all the work was done afterwards, but you got the agreement beforehand. And of course, our client was very impressed with their accountant having made a timely introduction. So bottom line is it takes two to tango. It can't be... Very rarely could it be swept under the carpet to be dealt with later. The next case study illustrates where we've come in after the fact to try and repair and protect the position. So uh, a trio of clients of ours, they own the block of FHLs between them in Torquay, which they had sold by the time they contacted us. They had made some claims on fixtures using some very questionable methodology, but it had gone through the pool and they didn't put any section 198 elections in place. This meant that they are exposed to either HMRC coming and knocking on the door and saying we want all that back, or to the new owners getting wise to the situation and referring it to the tribunal. So they 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 had a pretty hefty potential income tax risk there. So we unfortunately still managed the building, so we got access to, to the surveys, we calculated the amount that was there. We then contacted all the new owners, which had been sold to a long sequence of you know relatively green private investors. So it was a very long couple of weeks' work explaining what the hell we were talking about. To them but once we got over that hurdle we agreed that whatever we we added to our clients capital outs pool half would be sent to the new owners this closed off an income tax risk of over hundred thousand pounds for our client and delivered further savings of course it was a, a, a windfall from the sky for the for the new owners they had no idea what capital answers or fixtures were they were not impressed with their accounts at the time we didn't flag this up for many years and the much was quite destructive during the process um so the the moral of the story is that you can go back and repair a scenario after it's gone through, but you will need to make it interesting for the other parties involved. And generally, timely advice is better. Uh, this one just illustrates that the new legislation is not always in effect. Our client bought a building uh, as part of a large portfolio instruction. They bought one building in, in the city for £33 million, pounds, headquarters of a major bank. Of course, the larger a building is and the bigger names you see in the history, the more likely that somebody's covered this all up already. Fortunately, they bought it from a major pension fund. And in fact, it was pension funds all the way down, Chris, all the way back okay. from the 90s. So nobody ever had a right to claim on, the, on these fixtures. So the new legislation wasn't in effect because they couldn't add anything to the pool and therefore they couldn't comply with the fixed value requirement. So we went in, surveyed the building. There was a huge amount of tenant installations we had to adjust out. We still found 8.7 million pounds of the new pool additions, which uh, working on performance related fees was a nice end of the year for us. So. Moral of the story is that new legislation is not always in effect. It's always worth us having a quick check. Um, 
even if you go, oh, well, they're, they're you know, big players, I'm sure they've done this already, um, because it can be overlooked on surprising large transactions. We have worked for global businesses, major landowners with hundreds of millions of pounds of assets on the balance sheet who have not looked at this. Now, this very last case study, if you take nothing else away from today, take this, okay? This is the worst possible hand you can play and is not gonna win you any friends of your clients. A client of ours bought a care home in Essex for five million pounds from a major care home group. Again, hundreds of millions of pounds of balance sheet. They should have spent more on their conveyances. They sent our client via their solicitors a report compiled by Deloitte. I'm not here today for promoting Deloitte, so just having to crop up two times in the presentation, um, showing that 1.3 million pounds had been added to the capital allowances pools from the bill costs. Okay, they then moved to be completely silent on any sort of transfer values. It's a big tick in the box for mandatory pooling. We've got the evidence there. They've added this to the pool, but they haven't put in place a section 198 election. So we advise our client, stay quiet, you know, play dumb if you like. We will deal with this once the com completion's gone through. And we did. We surveyed the building. We then referred it to the tribunal to fix the termination. And we then got a phone call once they got their notifications to the tribunal from Price House Coopers, who are their new auditors of the care home group. I think they said PwC something like 15 times in the first minute. So they expected us to scream and fall off the chair or something like this. We didn't. We didn't accept the derisory opening offer. We held out for £1.17 million being transferred across by Section 198. We did take a bit of a knock from the 1.3 because any of you have any experience at the tribunal, it doesn't happen overnight and nothing's ever certain legal action. It could be appealed and it could drag on for ages. So our client made the judgment call that he would take most of it now rather than maybe take all of it at some point in the future. So cost to the care home group of not putting in place a one page election was £234,000 in corporation tax. Yeah. Care Home Group, last time we spoke to them, we found them up and said, would you like our help uh, bringing a negligence claim against your conveyances? They said, no, no need, we are already doing it. So it can be very costly not knowing the legislation. So, quick two minutes on the duty of care. Probably one minute, looking at the clock. Um, whose foot is that about to take a tumble on the banana? Um, bit of case law there for you. Uh, Clark versus Ilsbooth Bennett, if you know it, um, Mr. Clark successfully sued Ilsbooth Bennett for um, not having given him correct tax advice during sale of business and paying a lot more capital gains tax than he should have done. Uh, the solicitors turned around in the, in the case and said, well, the solicitors, we don't give tax advice. Look, it says on our, on our care letter, we don't give tax advice. The judge did not see it that way. The judge said that if you're putting yourself out there as an expert in a certain area, advising on a transaction, you have a duty of care to understand every facet of that transaction, even if it is a tax matter, okay? So this means, in my, my opinion, for a commercial transaction at least, the duty of care is slap bang on the conveyances desk. So everybody breathes a sigh, sigh of relief. Unfortunately, for, for you guys, our legal cousins are not um, ignorant when it comes to matters of liability. In fact, far from it. And what they tend to say is, this is very important, Chris. You need to speak to your accountant. And they phone up their accountants, and depending on what you say, and that you know, if they say, do I need to worry about this capital allowance business, or can you fill in these CPSEs for me? That duty of care may have been taken from the solicitor's desk and dumped on yours. So, uh, Meiji versus Harman Barker, an interesting one. I'm sure some of you know it's quite famous at the time. Um, Mr. Meiji um, initially successfully, it's been overturned at appeal now, but he sued Harman Barker for having introduced him to the wrong tax avoidance company. Yes, you heard me right there. It was Montpellier, so they've got they're no longer with us, so I can safely say that I think they were always the wrong tax avoidance company to be introduced to. Um, it was overturned at appeal. The judge said that Harvard Barker did not have a duty of care to understand all tax avoidance schemes, or else they would, in fact, de facto be a tax avoidance provider themselves. But he reiterated the initial decision was that an account, firm of accountants do have a duty of care to, to know when a certain area exceeds their capabilities and either to say point blank, we are not advising on this, or to bring it outside advisors. So this means you have a situation in general practice, which is summed up by this, um, this quote from a fictional character. Graveyard is full of middling swordsmen. Um, first time I used this quote, uh, it was at a live CPD lecture. Someone put their hand up and said, why are the swordsmen all hanging out in the, in, in the graveyard? Uh, maybe they're 
I don't know, smoking a rolly <laughs> or something like this. I don't know. It doesn't mean that, of course. I'm sure most of you worked out that it means obviously to being uh, knowing a little bit is very dangerous. Uh, you either want to be it's not not sort of at all, you want to be very good because of all the you end up dead and in the ground. Um, what does this mean? Well, your two choices: one, either learn the legislation, bring on board quantities various to the team, train them up, and put forward 100% correct advice in this area. Or two, you may possibly have other things to do, so yeah. you can refer the work on to a specialist like ourselves, and we can deal with everything for you. Now, this is no negative reflection on you. Tax regime is vast and growing at a rate of knots. The you know, obvious tax implication is fighting an uphill battle, which they are losing. Um, no one person or firm can be a master of all of it. So we always draw a parallel with medical profession. You wouldn't go and see your GP with pain in your chest and expect them to crack you open and do a triple bypass there and then in the practice. You would expect to be referred to the hospital, to the cardiac ward and specialist. And it's very similar in, in our industry. We are unfortunately not alone in this sector. We do have competitors. We have some very good competitors. But we have some not so good competitors as well. So we have, in fact, we have quite a lot of them. There are a number of firms out there making very small claims on the basis that the HMRC will never speak to them and therefore they can sleep easier. Uh, not great from a client's perspective because they're only getting some of the relief they could. And we also, at the other end of the spectrum, have a number of um, kind of cowboy outfits who you know very little about tax, seem to be working on a, you know, the old two year and sod off model on the basis that the questions will come later and they will not be around to answer them. We sit in the middle of the spectrum. We've been described as the Goldilocks of capital ounces of ice and that we are not too hot, we're not too cold. We are here to maximize the benefit to our clients. We will always get out, operate transparently, and we are 100% happy having a chat with any of our figures of HMRC. And Touchwood, because of this, they don't seem to want to speak to us much anymore. So why use us? Well, professional firm, we've been doing this for the best part of the last 10 years. We're a mixture of uh, qualified tax advisors. I sit at the Charter Institute of Taxes, Property Taxes Technical Committee. <gasps> we're really the snappy acronym. Uh, we've got certified charter accountants on the team with heavy tax focus. So with a whole host of different part qualifiers. All of our surveyors are chartered. Um, all of them bar one of RICS, one MCIOB. Um, we only charge as a percentage of what we deliver. We don't charge any fixed fees, the upfront fees, and everything is linked to the success of the claim. So if your clients are paying tax, and we've all checked this, you'll be surprised. Um, if they are paying tax, it is numerically impossible for them to be anything other than cash flow positive from the word go working with us. Track records, we've worked on over a thousand buildings in the last three years alone. Uh, many, many more over the whole history of the business. Every single uh, claim we put forward has been successful. Uh, we have had inquiries and we've had two claims reduced to date. Uh, the vast majority agreed at the original um, claim value. The largest reduction was just over 5%. So we're pretty, we're very confident with figures we put forward. At the bottom line, we do the work and we're not going to load it back onto you or back onto the client. There's a lot we can get from public sources. And we're the ones getting paid to do it. So we're the ones who should pull our finger out and, 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 and hunt the information down. And we do. So thank you very much for, for listening. Uh, if anything struck a chord, a couple of things we could do to work together. We obviously do a lot of individual case case reviews and all there's a conveyance going on, help guide you through the conveyance process. A number of PFP firms have literally come into their offices and reviewed the entire client bank from A through to Z to identify those that are hot potatoes and need advice now, those that could benefit yeah. and so on. Um, we can provide pro forma documents, elections, help with CPSE questions, uh, any form of resource within this area from newsletter content through to contract terms you might possibly need so thank you very much for listening i hope um now that you we fill in a bit of, bit of the background as to what we're talking about um i hope the the new legislation just touched the surface on it has given you some some idea of the areas you mean to flag up what what are the dangers and opportunities and if nothing else Hopefully you, you know how to protect your, your firm from any sort of non-compliance issues. So thank you very much for for listening. Yeah, thank you. We had, I know we have overrun slightly, so apologies for that. We do have a, a couple of questions that have come through, a couple of quick ones. Um, Bindi, thanks for your question. Um, development costs for an app, are capital allowances available on them? I think that's more of an R&D um, question there, so we'll certainly have a chat to you about that in a yep, different yep. area. Um, Carol, thanks for your question. Property was residential when it was purchased? Yep in 2008 since being used for a furnished holiday let can capital lounges be claimed now on the building yes it's a short answer um you're still looking back against the expenditure unless the purchase was in was made with the intention of becoming a furnished holiday let later you can't claim the aia um so there's a period of it being a buy to let or someone's home 
like the expenditure can still be apportioned in the normal way, even though it's, it's been converted later on. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, we, we really have run out of time, um, but thank you very much again for everyone tuning in. We have got a number of other questions that come through through. We will follow up with everyone um, after the webinar. Um, please look out for up and coming webinars and also podcasts as well that will be available for you. And again, thank you very much for listening and I hope you have a good afternoon and a good weekend. And thank yes. you, Andrew, for speaking. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody.